Hello, welcome to today's veterinary um, Facebook uh, neurology session and we are starting 2022 with a new series, a Facebook Journal Club series, where we're going to present to you uh, newly published material. Uh, straight from the mouth of the author and the author's team and uh, look at how the study was put together, why they put it together, the ins and outs, and, and what are the take-home messages so that potentially can help us in the future understand um, the results of this study and use it in, in our practice. Um, so we are really pleased to welcome um, Dr. James Whitlock here, and um, we're pleased uh, to meet you, James. Very good, very uh, many thanks for turning up here because we know that it can be, you know, you're the first one for this series. So <laughs> kudos to you. Thanks very much. Um, James graduated from 2015 uh, from the RBC, after which he worked in Kent uh, for a while and then did a rotating internship back at the RBC, and then did an Im imaging internship near Newmarket and is currently doing a, a residency in diagnostic imaging at Willows Veterinary Centre in the Midlands in England. So shout out to Willows and to all your team, James. I'm sure they're all watching and um, uh, very proud of you here uh, leading the way with this study. So um, welcome. And I uh, want to also shout out to Hallmark. Uh, thanks very much for sponsoring this Journal Club series. Uh, so, James, um, again, thanks so much for, for coming. We really want to uh, um, hear all about the study. Um, so we're going to hand it over to you. And I know you've got a, a PowerPoint presentation to, to get us going. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Yeah, no, real honour to be um, uh, one, of the, one of the first. So that's really kind of you. Um, right then, let's see if I get the first technical difficulty sharing the screen. But um, here we go. Ready? Right. Is that okay? So is that all good, guys? Perfect. Yeah, good. we can see that. Yeah. Perfect. So, um, uh, good evening, everyone. I suppose that's relative, uh, depending on where you're joining us in the world. But um, uh, I'd, I'd love to share with you uh, our project titled "The 1.5 Tesla Magnetic Resonance Imaging Features of Canine." Uh, intracranial interaxial hematomas. So the uh, the appearance of uh, hemorrhage on MRI can be quite complex owing to the uh, the the variable uh, signal intensities of the different blood breakdown uh, products. And this means that when we're trying to interpret what the underlying uh, pathology that might be responsible for for a hemorrhage in the brain, uh, it can be quite challenging sometimes um, to understand uh, what's going on. And so, what, so what do I mean by that? I mean the you know when we're faced with a situation where where there is a solitary interaxial uh, space occupying a hemorrhagic lesion, um, how can we differentiate between a benign hematoma or a hemorrhagic neoplastic mass? So this this sort of clinical conundrum was um, uh, observed by my my amazing um, supervisor, the the legendary Ines Carrera, uh, quite some years ago. Um, and uh, at a clinical level, it's it's actually um, you know it's especially you know to differentiate between these two different pathologies is is obviously very important because the uh, the clinical um, management of these two pathologies is, is vastly different. So we know with uh, interaxial hematomas uh, that uh, in both humans and man, that you know they can either be managed, managed surgically if they're um, uh, external enough, or uh, you know they, they do resolve over time, and we get uh, good return to neurological function in a, in a large proportion of cases. Whereas on the other hand, uh, hemorrhagic neoplasias, uh, you know, hemorrhage typically associated with higher grade um, malignancies. Uh, and so the prognosis is is not good. And, and typically in veterinary medicine, uh, the uh, euthanasia is opted, uh, is, is the option taken. Uh, and further adding to that, um, we see uh, in, in veterinary medicine that it's very rare that we achieve an anti-mortem diagnosis 
of hematoma versus neoplasia um, owing to cost constraints or simply due to the fact that the lesion is is too axial in location we can't access it um, access it by surgery um, so that this is one of the situations where uh making the right call based on imaging is actually is actually really important so in in human medicine the um the characteristics of uh human interaxial um if in interaxial hematomas um and interaxial hemorrhagic neoplasias have actually been very well described uh for some years now um so and i've just tried to summarize uh the main sort of differentiating uh, points in these two two boxes so starting off with interaxial hematomas so uh with interaxial hematomas their their signal intensity pattern um uh of of the heme hemoglobin breakdown blood but uh hemoglobin blood breakdown products evolves uh temporally as you would expect so we see for example, deoxyhemoglobin progressing to uh, intracellular methemoglobin um, over the normal time period you would expect. Um, and because you see that expected evolution, you also see resolution of the lesion in terms of reduction in the lesion size, um, re resolution of mass effects, and resolution of perilesion edema over time over, over, the, over the next month or so following uh, the hemorrhage event. And then another feature we see uh, is a complete circumferential T2 weighted and T1 weighted hyperintense rim, and this this uh, this imaging feature will come back to um, uh, in much more depth. And then finally, we also see a peripheral contrast enhancement um, with no uh, enhancement of any central um, portions of the hematoma lesion. And then moving on to the uh, the features of hemorrhagic neoplasia, they they stand at direct counterpoint to uh, those of the hematoma. So these lesions are very heterogeneous uh, in their signal intensity, with the regular areas of different blood breakdown products being present at different stages, um, and, and that's that's owing to the fact that you know in, in hemorrhage we see new foci of of um, uh, of hemorrhage all the time um, due to their progressive nature um, and then uh, we also see uh, not only delay of the we see delay of the evolution of those blood breakdown products um, and, and also because of because it's a mass we see a persistent mass effect and persistent perilesian edema uh, and then finally they uh, with neoplasias uh, they they either do not display this T2 weighted and T1 weighted hyperintense rim, or it's incomplete, or uh, yeah, so incomplete in nature and non circumferential. So, the aims of our project uh, was to describe the MRI features of canine interactual hematomas and to correlate those findings with the current understanding of hemorrhage evolution as, as we've seen in human brains. And we hypothesized that canine interactual hematomas would largely mirror those observed in humans. So by, de by design, the uh, study was retrospective, um, uh, multicentric uh, and descriptive in nature. And then to be included in the study, the, uh, uh, you know, the, each patient had to a complete brain MRI study. The MRI study had to obviously confirm the presence of a solitary hemorrhagic space occupying interaxial lesion. And then um, that lesion had to be confirmed as a hematoma by uh, um, either histopathologically or the patient had follow-up MRI that indicated a resolution or marked improvement of that, that lesion and or the patient had a complete resolution of their presenting neurological signs uh, with any supportive treatment. And then the patients were uh, excluded if they had an incomplete uh, medical data or an incomplete MRI study, uh, if they'd received cytotoxic therapy, um, if the repeat MRI showed uh, that the lesion had progressed or the lesion was static and in nature, um, 
or if there's insufficient clinical follow-up. So in terms of image evaluation, the MRI studies um, were reviewed by three observers independently, and then uh, we collectively evaluated the, uh, evaluated the images and, and made our final conclusions. And then, so the imaging features we, we looked for were the, the location of the hematoma, uh, the shape of the hematoma, the hematoma's signal intensity, uh, the presence uh, and the nature of the contrast enhancement, the presence of perilesian edema um, and mass effects. Uh, and then we also tried to estimate the age of the hemorrhagic lesions based on uh, their signal intensity pattern, pattern and correlating that to the, uh, the, present, the, the patient's presentation um, and um, first presentation of neurological signs. So um, moving on to the MRI findings. So the, we, we only had so 10, 10 cases in total, uh, and this just largely reflects um, uh, the sort of unique circumstances of having a solitary hemorrhagic lesion that, that was then able to meet our inclusion criteria. Uh, and I think we do get um, far more, uh, it, the presence of a solitary um, interactional hemorrhagic lesion is actually uh, far more common than that. But um, uh, to meet the inclusion criteria, again, that is quite a unique set of circumstances. Um, so in terms of le uh, hematoma location, the, the hematomas were all located within the white matter of the forebrain. Um, and uh, the most frequent locations were the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. Uh, and in terms of hematoma shape, they were all lobulated uh, and ellipsoidal or spherical in shape. And as you can see by the right hand image, the, all, all the hematomas were very well uh, and nicely marginated. And all 10 lesions were classified uh, to be two to seven days uh, post hemorrhage based on their signal intensity. So in that sort of early subacute uh, phase of hemorrhage. And then um, in terms of when, when we consider the lesions based on their overall signal intensity on T2 weighted and T1 weighted images, they were con all considered uh, heterogeneous, heterogeneous in nature. However, when, when we, there was a clear pattern with all 10 uh, hematoma lesions. So they had this um, uh, dual region um, dichotomous appearance. So they had this thin peripheral uh, rim region and then a larger central region. Again, this is nicely displayed in the, uh, in the lesion on the right. So when we then, so we then went to, to evaluate the signal intensities of the lesions uh, uh, looking at that peripheral and then the central region se separately. So on T2 weighted sequences and gradient echo sequences, the peripheral border region uh, was complete, circumferential and hypo-intense in all 10 cases. And then on uh, T1 weighted sequences, the um, in nine out of 10 cases, uh, the border region was again uh, hypo intense um, uh, and complete. In one case, uh, it was again complete, but was considered to be iso to hypo intense in its signal intensity. But what you can also appreciate is that the T1 um, on T1 sequences, the peripheral border region was uh, slightly thinner um, relative to its appearance on the T2-weighted and gradient echo sequences. And then the central region, um, so on T2-weighted sequences, uh, typically uh, it was, was hyper-intense or of mixed signal intensity. On gradient echo sequences, it was hypo to hyper-intense most often. And then T1 sequences, it was of, of mixed signal intensity. So now looking at in uh, contrast enhancement. So six out of oh, uh, six out of ten hematomas had evidence of contrast enhancement, 
And um, in all six of those cases, the uh, peripheral enhancement pattern, um, so sorry, the, the enhancement pattern was peripheral in nature and classified as obvious or, or faint. And importantly, we had this, this uh, negative finding that there was no evidence of uh, central enhancement um, with any of the uh, hematoma lesions. And, and this is nice, and this peripheral enhancement uh, was nicely displayed uh, in, in this lesion on the, on the right. And then, then looking at those dogs which had um, repeat MRIs and, we, and looking at the, the maturation process of the hema, hematomas over time. So four out of 10 dogs had uh, repeat MRI studies. Um, and this, the sort of average time between uh, the first MRI and these follow-up MRIs was, was around 60 days. In, um, so, and in all four cases, we saw that the lesions had uh, reduced dramatically in volume, uh, were hypo-intense in all sequences, and both uh, paralegial edema and uh, contrast enhancement uh, were, were absent. So putting, putting all this together, um, so the MRI features of two to seven days post hemorrhage interactive hematomas were as follows. So we saw uh, a clear uh, dichosmous lesion of signal intensity um, with these hematoma lesions. And um, they all had this complete TT weighted and uh, gradient echo hyper intense peripheral border region. So why do we see this and, and why, is, why is this important? Um, so, we obviously see um, uh, a different signal intensity patterns um, between the peripheral border and the, and the center, central regions because we've got two different blood breakdown products predominating um, in those regions. Uh, and the reason why we see this difference is because at the blood tissue interface at the peripheral, peripheral of the hematoma lesion, we see a, a far um, faster um, evolution of blood breakdown products so what they've shown in uh, in both humans and in uh, mouse models is that uh, we see uh, uh, more chronic breakdown products um, or traditionally thought of as more chronic breakdown products um, being present at the peripheral of the lesion um, within the acute um, phases of of bleeding so uh, in 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 mice they've seen that within within 24 four hours within that hyper acute stage we see hemosiderin and ferritin at the uh, periphery of the lesion um, due to that, uh, that that faster faster evolution and so uh, the and this is um and this is 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 important because uh, with this is not what we see with in the human studies uh, with neoplastic lesions because uh, they don't form this peripheral hyper intense uh, border region um, uh, due to uh, due to two reasons. Um, obviously, they they ha typically have. Uh, fresh fresh hemorrhage occurring within them which disrupts that border but also they uh, disrupt the blood brain uh, barrier and that leads to removal of these blood breakdown pro products uh, far more efficiently so again we that this complete um, uh, hyper intense border region uh, is not observed um, and i guess with with, uh, with when you this more ordered uh, appearance to uh, hematomas. Uh, we sort of, sort of hypo it's hypothesized it's because typically these hematoma lesions are occurring uh, from one uh, hemorrhagic event, um, whereas you're going to get um, a more variable, irregular regions of um, uh, different blood breakdown products with with neoplasias um, because of their um, progressive nature and the, the, the constant new hemorrhages appearing within them. Um, so you're not going to get this ordered um, central and uh, peripheral uh, region. 
And then uh, looking at the enhancement. So the, uh, so the, the peripheral enhancement with the hematoma lesion. So uh, what, they've, what they've found in, um, in canine experimental models is that uh, typically over sort of four to seven days uh, following um, intracranial hemorrhage, uh, and hematoma formation that uh, a very thin uh, fibrous capsule uh, forms around the hematoma lesion and within this capsule they've got um, new, new capillary um, uh, capillaries within this um, fibrous capsule layer uh, and on histopathology they correlated this uh, fibrous capsule uh, to the area of peripheral enhancement uh, that they see uh, so this is what is in, uh, so that was done in a, in a CT study, uh, and it's likely that what we're seeing on MRI reflects reflects that as well. Um, uh, and again, um, this is important because in in we're not going in in the neoplastic lesions, uh, not always, but quite often you're going to see. Um, yeah, sort of central portions of non-hemorrhagic tumor tissue um, elicit uh, contrast enhancement. So it's again a, an important differentiating feature from um, between hematomas and neoplasia. So the, the hematoma lesions aren't going to display central enhancement. And then finally, uh, looking at the um, uh, the evolution of, of hematomas. So, um, all the he so the the hematomas all reduced down in in volume, um, and there was a resolution of um, of, uh, of uh, perilesion edema, um, and so we're seeing this because the that peripheral rim of hemosiderin and and ferritin effective effectively. Um, in a central, uh, sorry, from a peripheral to central manner, um, uh, develops inwards and effectively fills in the rest of the hematoma lesion. And simultaneously, we see contraction of, of the hematoma lesion. Um, so you're left with a sort of cleft of hemosiderin and ferritin. And uh, in people, they hypothesize that this. Um, uh, cleft uh, of uh, persistent hemosiderin infertility. So this can be uh, present at the lesion for uh, for many years, um, and uh, they, th they think this may be the the cause of sort of post stroke um, uh, seizures and epilepsy. Um, but um, again, this is uh, a direct counterpoint to what we see in the aplasias. Um, we're going to see. Uh, because it's a tumor, you know, dividing um, uh, a lesion, you're going to see either static or um, the, the lesion is going to get get larger over time. So you're going to see persistent edema, uh, but also the the blood breakdown products within uh, a hemorrhagic neoplasia. Um, there, so not only is there not going to be non non resolution in terms of the mass effect and the overall tumor size, but we also see that the um, hemoglobin blood breakdown products don't evolve as you would expect over time. So uh, we see persistence of, for example, uh, deoxyhemoglobin won't uh, progress uh, and and be present within a lesion long, long, um, long after. Um, that initial one to three days um, that, that we typically see. So, uh, and this is because that in within lesions, they uh, within tumor lesions, they are there's there's areas of, of profound hypoxia, uh, and so that delays the uh, evolution of, um, of of blood breakdown products. So, again, that's a this is another important uh, differentiate uh, feature between the. Um, between the two different lesion types. So that is that is me all done. I've just included a few references here. The um, the first two references are um, really really fascinating papers, and they're they're both human studies uh, that were done in the, the mid to late eighties, and they were looking at uh, these um, uh, near, both hemorrhagic neoplasias and the imaging appearance of intracranial hematomas, um, and so they're. Uh, if you do get time, they're, they're definitely worth de definitely worth a read. Um, so yeah, that's um, that's that's me all done. So any questions are uh, very much welcome.
Thank you very much, James. Really interesting and uh, you know, excellent work and presentation. Um, there is a few questions for you. <clears throat> I promise none of them are um, you know, me or anything. Um, yeah. The first one um, from Miroslav, he wanted to know what kind of intracranial neoplasia tend to show hemorrhagic characteristic. I mean, if you can just give some example of um, you know what kind of I think, um, so um, so obviously I think it springs to mind straight away hemangiosarcoma, um, but typically uh, obviously uh, typically the most I mean, mostly they appear with multiple lesions within the brain, um, but it, it obviously can be a solitary lesion on um, uh, hematomas. Um, uh, um, uh, I suppose any any metastatic um, yeah. uh, neoplasia um, would, would potential to bleed um, a high grade uh, oligodendrogliomas. Um, yeah, I, th I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm, absolutely. I'm, to, to, for um, you know, for Miroslav, just any tumor could potentially, you know, um, oh, yeah. bridge, but usually it's mostly high grade tumor where there is neovascularization and by nature these vessels are more prone to rupture um, yeah. and cause hemorrhage and the other cat big category is obviously all the metastatic because yeah. there is rupture of the blood brain barrier so that's yeah. but in theory is any you know any, any tumor as you say and what could be the difference between hematoma with and without peripheral contrast enhancement i think you already kind of answer that it's a kind of the timing of the hematoma Exactly. Yeah. So, so during the acute stages, you might not, you might not see, so uh, you might not see any peripheral enhancements. Uh, and obviously, it's a, there's there's a window for the enhancement because that obviously resolves with time. Um, so, I, to be honest, I'm not sure when it uh, completely resolves, but typically, so, but in those dogs, you know, we're typically imaging two months down the line, and we're not seeing any further. Uh, enhancement with, with the lesion, so maybe you know, that one to two month period, you might not see any further enhancement. But if, certainly after the, so during the acute phase, one to three, four days, you might not see enhancement. And then after in that, in, in the next sort of, um, you know, uh, ten to fourteen days, you'll probably see enhancement. And as you explained for Miroslav, again, it's the neovascularization, you know, yes. in this capsule that is causing the contrast yeah. announcement. Um, the other question is, um, what would be the recommended time point to re-MRI this lesion? Um, yeah, what? I think um, I think it's, uh, I suppose there's many factors to consider. Um, obviously, the, these, these hematoma lesions are, obviously, we, we, we call them benign, but they are, they're obviously space occupying lesions and, and can cause, I suppose it depends on, the neurological status of your patient, um, uh, because I suppose the, the, I'm sorry, I'm answering this question in a very roundabout way, but the, um, I suppose what this paper uh, highlights that if, 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 for example, you're presented with one of these lesions and there is some doubt as to if, if it's neoplastic or if it's um, a hematoma lesion, um, uh, then, then you could potentially one of the options, and if it's in the patient's interest and welfare, uh, is is leaving uh, leaving uh, any clinical decision making uh, in terms of cytotoxic therapy or radiotherapy, or uh, and seeing if if the lesion improves over time. Um, uh, and I, I guess um, I guess I think you would expect to see an improvement within within. Um, Within three to four weeks, or, or, uh, or yeah. maybe, yeah, I think a month would would be would be would be acceptable. I think. I think clinically it would be strange not to improve, you know, and uh, you will yeah. expect the reverse, you know, within yeah. a few weeks you will expect the the tumor yeah. to get worse. Yeah, and I suppose you just, but then again, you might not. I suppose in the case of with a progressive neoplasia, you're going to your patient's going to deteriorate. Um, that will probably make your decision for you before you have to take it to MRI. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So, J Jonathan, to, uh, you know, we don't know when is the best time. We usually say a couple of months, uh, very randomly. 
you know, and, and I think it's been the same with postictal changes to know are they actually, you know, if you got changes on the brain, is it postictal or periectal or is it, you know, an inflammatory lesion or if you got in the in the piriform log, sometimes we have the issue, is it periectal, is it glioma? You know, it's along the piece of string, we go to clinical sign and then we usually say a couple of months, but should we do sooner? Don't know, don't know. That's the, the thing. Um, we move to Italy, Stefania. Um, according to um, you, what kind of neoplastic lesion could be, could be confused with hematoma and tend to show hemorrhagic patterns? Well, we kind of cover that. Yeah, so we, we covered that. Yeah, but, um, yeah, I think um, as, as, as we've already in a high grade um, uh, metastatic and interaxial uh, neoplasias uh, of the brain, I think. Um, can all could all appear could all appear like this, um, but I, I I guess um, I, I, I think well you guys probably have well you obviously have far more experience but um, you probably uh, in your day to day work seeing far more MRI brain MRI than even than I do um, and the occurrence of 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 this but um yeah yeah I think the the, the contrast enhancement also can be um, for example with um, ring enhancing glioma they tend to get um you know more delay uh contrast enhancement you know yep. more central contrast enhancement and that go a bit with one of the question um i think from france now um in the dog you selected do you know what was the delay between the gadolinium injection and acquisition of t1 sequence and i think you is making allusion to this glioma that tend to have delay central contrast enhancement okay yeah um that's that's a really good question and in all honesty um i i do not know um because this is a multi-centric study um and uh i don't know what the timings would have been for all all the um uh for all the for all the studies um I can only there's a there's a few here at Willows and um, and which displayed uh, peripheral enhancement and and that's that would have been uh, literally a matter of uh, you know a minute or so so um, you know that's the typ typical typically how we run things here um, but yeah that's a good question and I don't know I think for me it would be more the actually the one of the confusing but i haven't seen the question would be the difference between um this hematoma and a brain abscess because they both had t2 and t2 star uh, you know hypo intense uh, yeah. ring to some degree and they have also you know contrast enhancement um so that could you know be actually tricky yeah. to differentiate between the two yeah i'm looking at sort of adc values and um You'd, I, I guess you'd have to put it all together. Um, um, yeah, another another potential um, differentiation. Differentiation, yeah. Let's take a couple more questions. Um, everyone, everyone is obviously saying how great the work. Um, I've seen in your T1 sequences there are not so good spatial resolution, and in the dorsal ring, high point dense margin, you lose a bit of signal. Do you think? Or have experience if a better spatial resolution enhances the hypointense ring or its thickness. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's um, yeah, it is. It is. So with it, with it, with it on the T1 sequences, um, uh, very lucky here we do a uh, well in uh, in most of the in the most of the studies that we um, we looked at, we could. Um, we could look at it in if we did a, a volumetric um so we could look at it in all planes um which meant that um even though that it was it was thin we could we had the privilege of like so if there's partial volume averaging or um you know that might look like the the peripheral region was incomplete we could appreciate it in all three in all three planes and then we can conclude that that actually that was that was fine so that's I, yeah, I haven't got a definitive answer, but that was how we overcame that problem um, in, in most most circumstances. And let's take the last one. Don't want to get you too tired after a long day at work. Um, Emily um, is asking, what kind of um, hemorrhagic lesion 
you know, and uh, I'm, if you want to do it. Yeah, this is a really, this is a really good question. And uh, so in the, so only, in only one case did we, um, uh, one, one patient was found to be hypertensive. So uh, that might have been the a sort of a primary cause for uh, this, these hematoma lesions. But in all the others, it would have been classed as idiopathic. Um, mm. uh, and, I, and, and that's some, um, and that is quite typical for these lesions. Uh, we don't don't typically find the underlying uh, cause. Um, yeah, I've I'd, and I've, I've debated this like uh, as well with 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 the neurology members um, here, and we it, it's a it's a hard one to answer. I don't know. It's like so all the dogs were, for example, uh, angiostrongus is negative. Um, they uh, and they had no uh, coagulopathy, uh, no no clotting problems. Um, so all the clotting times were normal. Um, so I guess that leads, um, you know, so potentially um, you could see maybe even so some primary causes of, of hemorrhage. Would, I don't know, like a steroid um and more damlock uh, so i don't know um or or or, or like a and then I, I i then for example i talked to Innes about this yesterday and i said well maybe like a, a vascular malformation or something um but she said no, well she she said that was unlikely because um they, again they, you, you wouldn't see because it's like an aneurysm you wouldn't see resolution of the or the resolution of the lesion um uh so it's a, it's a really good question, and um, I don't think I quite have the answer. But, um, but I think the, the aim of the paper was really to know is it a neoplastic, you know, hemorrhage, yeah. or yeah. is it non neoplastic? And the non neoplastic happened, but a lot of them were idiopathic. Um, yeah. But I think you know, if there was, because I've, I've looked retrospectively at the Angelus Angelus, um, you know. I don't think the conclusion should be we should not look for an underlying cause aside from neoplasia because it could be androsangelus, they could be coagulopathy, over coagulopathy, and so on. It's just that yeah. in this space series, um, there yeah, was exactly. no, no underlying cause, but it was mostly the dichotomy neoplastic, non neoplastic. That was the, the main aim. Yeah, I think I'm sorry if we can't take all the questions. Uh, we need to give a little bit of time for James to recover for his day. And uh, but James, thank you so much. Um, I always say for me, you know, a great paper is a paper that you can take back to the clinic, and that give you clear guidance to solve a clinical problem. And here, the clinical problem is very simple. You do an MRI, you find this lesion. Should you go down the route of this is neoplastic, and obviously, treatment prognosis will change completely or is non-neoplastic and then we look at possible cause for you know uh, bleeding and the prognosis and therefore the communication of the owner will be much more positive so yeah. in, in in that respect the paper really tickled the box you know for what i consider a useful very useful paper so thank you very much i just like to thank um i just like to reiterate my, my thanks to Ines, who who is the genius behind behind the project and um so um i just love to thank her she was amazing so i will bring of new amazing simon you can have the last word yeah i know i want to just back that up james thank you very much for for a great presentation and, and a really practical subject it is one that we uh do often struggle with trying to differentiate uh, what might be a reasonable outcome uh, for a case based on it being a hematoma versus one with a more sinister outcome if it's a hemorrhagic neoplasm so thanks very much uh, for that Re really nice um, and thank you for being our inaugural journal club speaker uh, we're planning to do this every other month um, james's paper is open access so please uh, try and search it out get get that and have a read through um, we're going to do a similar format every other month for the Journal Club. If you feel like you um, are just about to publish something, know that you're going to about publish something, just head it out, and you want to uh, take part, please uh, get in touch with us. We'd be more than happy to uh, um, give your give your work a um, bit of showtime here and uh, let you discuss it with us. So thanks very much for that. Thanks again to Hallmark for sponsoring it. And... Um, We'll hope to see you again all soon.
Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good night. Bye. Thank Thanks, you. James. Bye-bye.